Well, it's good to have you uh, with us this morning. We are currently in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, we're coming to one of the harder chapters in this book. Well, I shouldn't say harder. It's one of the harshest chapters in this book. And uh, Jesus will really lay into the religious leaders and really calls them on the carpet. So let's open a word of prayer and see what the Lord has for us this morning. And Lord willing, we will be here Sunday next week, starting Matthew 24, if the world is still spinning at that time. <laughs> um, but yeah, chapter 24 is uh, all about the last days, and it's stuff that you know is in our future, the near future. And we'll look in uh, chapter 24 in detail. There's a lot of um, amazing prophecies there, and we'll see that God is not done with the Jewish people, and He'll do a mighty work in them in the last days. So, now we get to look at Jesus rebuking religious hypocrites. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your goodness, Your grace. We thank You for Your mercy, Your love, Your compassion. Lord, we know apart from you, we would be toast. We would not be able to stand in your presence. Lord, we would uh, be labeled just like all these religious hypocrites are labeled by you. And they would, uh, we, we would have no hope without you, Jesus. And so I just pray that you'd remind us of all the good things you've done in our lives. And as we look at this chapter that we would have ears to hear what your Spirit is saying to us, and that we would have discernment for the things going on around us in the spiritual realm, because we see so much hypocrisy around us in religion. And Lord, you desire a relationship with us, and so may we grow in our intimacy with you, in our relationship that you established with us. And we love you and we thank you that you who began this good work in us, you will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So turn to Matthew 23. This chapter contains the most heated, harshest, the, the most scathing remarks by Jesus Christ. This will be his last public discourse. Um, before he goes to the cross. He will give us more insights. Uh, he'll teach the disciples a lot more. But this is his last public um, speaking engagement, you might say. He's going to speak to the crowds here on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And boy, is this ever a doozy. I mean, he's going to warn the people of the hypocrisy of the religious leaders He'll go uh, off in these guys and pronounce eight woes against them, against their self-righteousness. Now remember, this is in response to Jesus being questioned repeatedly by these same religious leaders. They were trying to trip Jesus up. They're trying to trap him in his words. And so he is responding to them at this point. He turns the tables on them, so to speak, and he'll go on the offensive and put them in their place. Now, he will call them hypocrites seven times in this chapter. If you remember when we started the book of Matthew, he uses the word hypocrite 14 times, which is twice as many times as in the rest of the Bible. And so Matthew, who was a uh, he was a tax collector before he got saved. He was a traitor to the people of Israel. He was looked down upon. He ripped people off. And he knows what religious hypocrisy looks like. He was from the tribe of Levi. He should have known better than the things he was doing. But he gets radically saved by Jesus. And so now he you know, sees the hypocrisy. And he, you know, he repeats what Jesus says about the hypocrites here. And again, the word Hupocrites, the Greek word for hypocrites, means to play the part of an actor. It's putting on a mask and pretending to be something that you're not. So this is a really good chapter for all of us, especially for those who say they're sick and tired of all the religious hypocrisy that we see you know, so often in so many places around us. As much as we don't like to see religious hypocrisy, Jesus cannot stand it. You know, that's why he calls these people on the carpet. 
Um, he doesn't want anybody, any of us, misrepresenting his name or his nature to other people. Again, Jesus wants a relationship with us, not religion. So chapter 23, starting in verse 1, this is right after, so this is probably Tuesday afternoon. He'll be arrested Thursday night. He'll be crucified Friday He'll be in the tomb, rise up from the dead on the, the, you know, the first day of the week, Sunday morning. So this is the last week, last few days of his earthly ministry. So Jesus spoke to the multitudes and said to his disciples, or to the multitudes and to his disciples, again, he's on the Temple Mount. This is Passover week, hundreds of thousands. Well, they guesstimate about 2 million people in Jerusalem for Passover every year, but thousands on the Temple Mount as well, and that's where he is. And so he's addressing the people there, speaking to the multitude, saying, verse 2, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. That means that they sit in the seat of authority. These guys are supposed to be representing the law of God to the people. They're in the place of authority in Israel. They're supposed to be keepers and guardians of God's law. So he says, they sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, verse 3, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But... Do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. Uh, that's the true definition of hypocrisy. They tell you what to do. They tell you how to live. They tell you what God expects from you, but they do just the opposite. I don't know about your parents, but my parents were big hypocrites when I was growing up. Jeff, don't do this. But they would do it. Jeff, do this, but they wouldn't do it. And it's confusing when you're growing up in that kind of environment. But that's what these guys were doing, telling the people, this is what you need to do, but they don't do it themselves. So when Jesus tells them, whatever they tell you to observe, again here in verse 3, that observe and do. I mean, he's letting the people know the scriptures the Pharisees are quoting, that's God's word. So they're saying the right words, so obey God's word. But what they do, don't follow them, because they are hypocrites. They're not following God's word. Again, God's word is the final authority, not the person delivering it. I'm not the final authority. God's word is what we always go back to. This is the final authority. Hypocrites always make it harder to receive the word of God. Satan loves it when religious people are being hypocrites because he knows that's going to turn a lot of people away from the Lord. You know, how much the world says, oh, these Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. And in many instances, they're right. But Jesus wants us to put off the deeds of darkness, walk in the light. He wants us to be examples to those around us of his nature, his character, his goodness and grace. This is what Peter exhorts the church elders and the leaders there in 1 Peter 5, verses 2 and 3. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. In other words, you're not in the ministry for money, but there are unfortunately a lot of pastors and so-called evangelists that are, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you but being examples to the flock. Religious hypocrites are rarely examples to the flock. They're, they're examples of what not to do, and God will judge them in the end. In Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For whenever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge, practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Very important question. If you're telling people, well, you shouldn't be doing that, but you're doing it. You're simply a hypocrite. You'll come under the same judgment. Verse 4, Jesus says of them, now again, he's speaking to all the multitudes, his disciples, 
And he says, for they, speaking about the religious leaders, they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So he makes it very clear. This is one of the evidences of hypocrisy. They will place heavy burdens upon the people, upon your shoulders. This usually happens when they start adding a bunch of rules and rituals and regulations onto God's Word, and what corresponds will be a lack of grace, a lack of mercy, a lack of compassion, a lack of love. So we need to stay true to God's Word. Again, if you're telling people how they should live and you're not living it out in your own life, you are a hypocrite. And if you're telling people what they should be doing and what they should not be doing, and you're adding to or taking away from God's Word, then you're a false teacher. This is why Jesus tells us in Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30, because He knows how burdened down the people are because of these religious hypocrites, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden with religion. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Again, keep that in mind as we go through this chapter he is alone, Jesus alone is the perfect example of grace and mercy and compassion and righteousness and truth. And everything these hypocrites do is 180 degree opposite of how Jesus ministers to us. Now, be careful. Don't let the hypocrisy of other people turn you away from the Lord and turn you away from God's word. Again, only Jesus is perfect. Only His Word is true and genuine. His heart towards us is to lift burdens off of us, not put burdens upon us. So look at verse 5. He says, But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. Now, again, Orthodox Jews took what Jesus said, or took what God said in the Old Testament, and they turned it into a prideful religious act on their part. God wanted His people to have the Word of God in their hearts. In that picture, um, you know, Michelle and Robin and Jennifer were in Israel last month, and uh, they asked, why is this guy wearing this big, giant thing? Well, uh, they, the woman told them, well, it's kind of like a woman with her diamond ring. The bigger the diamond, you know, the more impressed people are. So the bigger the hat or phylactery, the more impressed people will be. That's what that's referring to. But God wanted the word in our hearts, in their hearts. He gave the Jewish people a way to remind them about this through the phylacteries, through binding the word of God into their hearts, first and foremost, putting the mezuzah on the wall and all these different things. We looked at the Shema last week, the Shema where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and you know, soul, and strength. And then the very next thing he says is Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 9. And the Lord says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Again, that's priority number one. You shall teach them diligently to your children, shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So that was what it meant was to have these things in your heart, but as a reminder, you know, bind it on your arm. You put the little leather box on your head. But to them, the reality of religion became more important than the reality of a relationship with God. So again, they put bigger, bigger boxes on their head. Uh, you go to Israel, and some of these Orthodox Jews, these guys will just take leather straps and just bind their arms super tight. The, I mean, the skin is just popping up because they're so tight with this. They want people to be impressed by this. In Numbers 15, starting in verse 38, God tells them about the tassels on their garments, their robes. This is what Jesus is also speaking about. Speak to the children of Israel, tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations, 
and to put a blue thread, just one little blue thread, in the tassels of the corners, and you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it, this blue thread, and remember all the commandments of the Lord, and do them that you may not follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined. And so these things were to be a reminder to the people of God. Get the Word of God into your heart, first and foremost. You know, a lot of people will put those Scripture verses on their refrigerator in their bathroom, and that's great. Nothing wrong with that at all. But these guys would substitute that reality of getting the Word in their heart to just an outward sign, wanting people to look at them and think, wow, they're so religious. This guy's got the long tassels in that picture. And they would start putting more and more blue in their tassels because it, they're supposed to put one blue thread to remind them, hey, keep your eyes on the Lord. But they put a lot of blue in their tassels because they want other people to think, wow, this guy's so religious. And that's what it all boiled down to. Again, nothing wrong with these things, but the problem arises when the outward actions replaces the inward reality of your relationship with the Lord. So again, these guys were trying to show off, you know, just how religious they were. You remember in Matthew chapter 9, that woman that had the issue of blood, and she came up from behind Jesus, and she said, if I just could touch the hem of his garment, that tassel, I'll be healed. I mean, she probably looked at Jesus as, this guy really knows the Lord. You know, this guy's really true to what he's saying. This guy's not a hypocrite. And that's why she reached out, touched the hem of his garment, and she was healed. But verse 6, they, Jesus says, these religious leaders, they love the best places at feasts. You know, they're first in line. They're going to load up their plate first. The best seats in the synagogue. I want to sit right down front. Well, okay. A few of you. Greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. In other words, these religious hypocrites loved the attention. They loved to be seen by others. They loved to be called Rabbi or teacher. They loved, you know, the people to pamper them and to think very highly of them. And they wanted that best seat in the synagogue or whatever celebration they were part of. Again, there are a lot of religious people like that. They love to be recognized as special, as gifted, as anointed. And they love these titles thrown at them. So in verse 8, Jesus says, But you, speaking to the multitudes, but you do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, the Messiah. And you are all brethren. So he switches from talking about them and they, those religious hypocrites, to you, the multitudes of people. In other words, don't get hung up on titles. There's one perfect rabbi teacher, and that's Jesus Christ. The rest of us, we're all brethren here. You know, he says, you're all brothers, you're all sisters in Christ. Yes, we have um, different roles, responsibilities, and church leadership and so forth, but at the foot of the cross, we're all equal. There's no hierarchy. Jesus is the head. The rest of us were just various parts of his body, but he is the head. We're all equal before the Lord. People often ask me, so what do I call you? What, what do you want to be you know, titled? And it's like, uh, just call me Jeff. You know, I mean, who cares about the titles? Some people get hung up on, oh, yes, I want to be the most holy reverend or whatever. I got a letter once and it was addressed to the most holy reverend Jeff Johnson. I, who is that? I don't know who that is. I mean, come on. I'm not going to buy into your suck up -ism or whatever it is. Anyway, verse 9, he says, Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. Again, this is in the sense that you don't call someone father intimating that they're your spiritual ruler, they're your spiritual authority over your life. You know, a lot of us, we call our dad, dad or papa, or some of you may have had a more formal relationship, father. He's not talking about biology. There's nothing wrong with that. He's talking about, in the spiritual sense, there's only one God the Father. There's only one we bow our knee to. There's only one we worship. The only titles we give are to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
You might be a counselor. That's great. But there's only one wonderful counselor, and that's Jesus Christ. There's only one Jesus. One, you know, God the Father. There's only one Holy Spirit. The three make up one. Jesus is the one we look to. All glory, all honor goes to him. Look at verse 11. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servants. Now, we saw Jesus already telling the 12 disciples this very thing back in chapter 20, because they were arguing among themselves, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You know, which one of us is the best? Which one of us is superior to the others? And that's when Jesus told them, hey, the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over one another, yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to be great among you, let him learn to be the servant of all. Totally different than the ways of the world. And then Jesus said this in Matthew 20, in that same scenario, verse 28, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And right along with this, Jesus says here in verse 12, And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will will be exalted. Again, the greatest example of this is Jesus Christ himself. He left the glory of heaven. God the Son, seated at the right hand of the Father for eternity past, humbles himself, comes into this world, takes on a human body, born in the manger, you know, the whole scenario. He grows up perfect in every way, but he came into this sinful world. Philippians 2, verses 8 and 9 tells us, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. And then it goes on to say, Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So Jesus is that perfect example. He's the greatest, but he became the servant. In John chapter 13, we see Jesus washing the disciples' feet. That was the lowest place you could be in a household, somebody's servant that washes feet. But then after he finishes, he says, I've given you this example that you do likewise. Take that servant role. Both James and Peter tell us, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. Humility. It's simply recognizing that apart from Jesus Christ, you and I, we can do nothing. But humility also means that we acknowledge that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And we understand it's not about us, it's all about Jesus. Genuine humility is simply knowing who we really are in Christ and knowing that we can do nothing apart from Christ. But we can do all things through him who strengthens us. But it's all about Jesus. When we understand these things, even to a small degree, then we also know that everything we have in Christ is all because of his amazing grace. It's not because you and I deserve anything good from God. It's all because of his grace. So now these religious leaders, they just could not humble themselves before their Messiah, Jesus, And so now he's really going to come hard against these hypocrites. It's interesting because you remember when he started his public ministry, he gave eight blessings to the people, known as the Beatitudes. And now his last public ministry, he gives eight woes, judgments, to these religious hypocrites. Verse 13 But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. After just warning the multitudes about these religious leaders, Jesus now turns to them, and they're probably standing all clustered off to the side, just seething, I mean, they're listening to what Jesus is saying about them, and they're just upset. I'm sure everybody there was stunned because nobody spoke to the religious leaders like this. But his accusation against them is this. They shut up the kingdom of heaven against the common people that were just wanting to know the Lord. They just wanted to worship God. They just wanted to, you know, 
enter into that relationship with God, but these guys were standing in the way. It's like, you know, God's the door. The people just want to come to the Lord. And these guys are like, nope, you can't come in. And Jesus says, they're not going in. They're not saved. And they're preventing people that want to come to know the Lord from getting saved. Instead of bringing the people to the Lord by faith, these guys were standing between God and the people. And they weren't allowing them to enter. Remember, there's only one mediator between God and men. That's the man Christ Jesus. That's what Paul tells Timothy. This is what religion still does today. Those in power oftentimes place many obstacles in the way so that they hinder people from entering into that relationship with God, where they can experience God's grace, His mercy, His forgiveness for sin, His love. And it usually comes in the form of legalism. God won't accept you until you do this, until you act this way, until you straighten up your life, until you put on a suit and tie or whatever it might be. You know, when I got saved in 1977, it was still towards the end of the Jesus movement. And, you know, when I went to, when I got saved, it was unbelievable. It was amazing. It was radical. And, you know, I was a beach bum. I played baseball. That was my life. That was it. And, you know, when I would go to church as a new believer, a lot of times it was like, just finished surfing. My friend and I would just hose off. We're in our Birdwell beach britches, our sandals, to have a t-shirt on. We'd run and get into church there as it's starting. You know, that was usually a Wednesday night we'd be doing that. I mean, you were accepted the way you are. You realize God is at work on the inside. He's changing my heart from the inside out. Religion starts on the outside and tries to conform you into some whatever they're trying to conform you into. You know, some places they wouldn't accept us. You know, there was a lot of churches back then, and Pastor Chuck was great at this. That's how the Jesus movement started, was just accepting all these hippies just the way they were. Dirty, smelly, bare feet. You know, Chuck had a board meeting. They just put a new carpet, and all these hippies are showing up. It's just exploding. And the elders took it on themselves to put a sign out front saying, no shoes, no shirt, no service is basically what they said. And Chuck saw that. He ripped it down, and he got on his elder's case and said, you know what? If this carpet is more important than the, you know, the souls of these hippies that are getting saved, then we need to rip out the carpet. I mean, that was the heart of someone who understood God looks at the heart. He doesn't care about the outward appearance. He works from the inside out. Religion tries to conform us from the outside in, but it can't because it doesn't know anything about the heart. So again, verse 14, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers they just love to stand in the street corners and be seen by men. Jesus talked about that back in chapter 6. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. One of the responsibilities of the scribes, in this regard, they were kind of like lawyers, is when a woman was left a widow, when her husband dies, these scribes are supposed to work up a will for her to make sure that her assets were protected, that she would have her home, that she'd be able to survive, live for the rest of her life. These scribes that come along and say, I'll help you. I'll write this up, but I want half. That's what they were doing. And so they were just ripping off the people. James 1.27 says this, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Again, these guys were doing just the opposite. They would take advantage of those who were hurting, who were struggling. And so Jesus says, greater condemnation they will receive. Verse 15, he says, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. In other words, bringing in more people who were greedy, who were wicked, who were covetous. That's all they were doing is winning more people to be just like them. He says you're turning them into you know, even more sons of hell than you guys are. A modern analogy would be these groups that go around knocking on your door, riding their 10 speeds or whatever they ride these days, 
And they knock on your door, they'll knock on a hundred doors, try to win one proselyte. But guess what? They're all going to hell without Jesus because they're proclaiming a false Christ, a false Messiah. So sad because they're not leading anyone to faith in Christ for salvation. Verse 16, Woe to you blind guides who say, Whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. That's what these guys were saying. Jesus says, fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? So he's really ripping into these guys because they were saying that if you swore by the temple or you swore by the altar within the temple, it was no big deal. Yeah, it's just God's temple. It's just his altar. But if you swore by the gold on the temple or you swore by the sacrifice you put on that altar, then you were obliged to pay it. So he's saying, you value gold above God. You value the gifts more than you value worshiping God because that's what the altar is all about. You're worshiping the Lord through that sacrifice. Nothing's new under the sun. This is what the word of faith is doing today. We want, gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give God. I'm going to name it and claim it. And it becomes more about the gift than the giver. Same thing. No different. We can put a Christian spin on it, but it's no different. People often look at God as a genie in a bottle, and they can just get stuff from him rather than surrendering our lives to him. So different. So important. So notice twice in these verses, Jesus calls these guys fools and blind simply means the things they were doing, the things they said to the people were absurd. It was irrational. You might say it was moronic. You know, Jesus may have been thinking Psalm 14.1 as he is preaching this to them. Look at Psalm 14.1. The fool, fools and blind, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. It's a picture of the Sadducees as well, the other religious leaders. There's no resurrection. There's no angels. There's no afterlife. Fools, blind guides. Now, these religious leaders were the epitome of what Jesus said. Look at these verses in Matthew 15 that we looked at a few months ago or whenever it was. Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9. He, Jesus is quoting Isaiah 29. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And so these Pharisees and scribes, they were guilty of misrepresenting God in everything they did. In everything they said, they misrepresented the Lord. So look at verse 20. Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. This is Jesus' way of saying, your yes better be yes, your no better be no. Stop looking for ways to avoid the simple and clear teachings of God's word. Unfortunately, there's never been a lack of, you know, scam artists, religious hucksters. They're in the world. They're in the, they've been in the world. They've been in the world of religion from day one. But this is why it's so important to have a good grasp of God's Word. This, again, is the final authority. Not our opinions, but the Word of God. This is what will protect you. This is what will drive off the lies of the enemy and, you know, the demons that are following after Satan. The Word of God, we need to have a handle on it. We need to hold fast to it. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to work these truths into our hearts and out of our lives. Remember what Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, 
and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In referring to the Word of God, this is what Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them in truth. Your Word is truth. That's just the opposite of the lies of religion. They will bring you into bondage. They'll bring you into despair. That will lead you into depression. That will lead you into fear. So hold fast to the Word of God. Verse 23, it gets even better. Hope you're having fun. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done, without leaving the others undone, blind guides, who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. In other words, these guys were majoring on the minors. They weren't majoring on the major things. They weren't keeping the most important things the most important things. These guys were meticulous when it came to tithing their little seeds. That's what he's talking about, the cumin seed, the anise seeds. Here's one seed for you, God, and I get the nine seeds. Here's, you know, one seed of cumin. I keep nine for myself. Very meticulous. But when it came to mercy and justice, righteousness, truth, all these things that God really wanted them to be part of and to practice, they just blew it off. They didn't care about it. Jesus said, hey, that's fine. You're doing that, being meticulous with these seeds. Nothing wrong with that. But the really important things that God cares about are justice, mercy, faith. And here Jesus uses a common proverb of the day where he says, you'll spit out a gnat and you'll swallow a camel. I mean, they would go to the nth degree to make sure when they were, you know, they have their goblets and they're going to pour wine into it, they'd have, you know, a piece of cloth over the wine glass. So when they poured it, no gnats that might have gotten into the wine would go into their goblet. You know, they weren't so much concerned about drinking a gnat. It was drinking a gnat that may have been on a Gentile. That's why they were so meticulous about making sure we get every gnat out of there. It may have been on an unclean Gentile. But then he says, you don't have a problem eating a camel. Now, he's being, you know, very metaphorical here because nobody in Israel ever ate camels. They were the largest unclean animal in Israel. But he's just saying, strain out a gnat, you'll eat a camel. You'll tithe one seed here, but you put off the big things that matter. That's the point he's making here. That's what legalism does. It gets you focused on all these little bitty things so you ignore or are oblivious to the most important things in your relationship with Christ. Legalism will always cause you to become self-focused rather than keeping your focus on Jesus. It's only as we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit that we can see things that God wants us to focus on, to see things from His perspective. So verse 25, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, <laughs> first cleanse. I'd love to be up there listening to this. So he's just, I mean, just railing on these guys. And they were seething. I'm sure their faces were red. But he says, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful hourly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Again, these woes are very similar. Hypocrites will always appear to be clean and holy and righteous on the outside, you know, there's a lot of religious people. They want to make sure everything looks good. And yet inside, they're full of dead men's bones. They're full of death. They're full of destruction. They're full of guilt and shame. Again, religion, and we see religion all around us. We've got a whole state to our east or west of us that's religious. And they make it a point to look very, very wholesome, family-oriented. They look great on the outside. But this is exactly what he's referring to. Inside you're dead because you don't have Jesus. He is the author of life. It's a different Jesus they worship. So when we do our Wednesday night series, 
doing going through the apologetic series. The last one, it's a Wednesday and a Thursday. Bill McKeever, he's the head of Mormonism Research Ministries. I, you know, th these are going to be awesome. And this guy, he has a podcast over in Salt Lake City. They do a radio program in Salt Lake City. They've reached so many thousands of Mormons and seen many, many thousands come to Christ just hearing the truth of God's word versus the lies of the Mormon church. And so important, since we're getting a temple built here, I thought that would be good timing, and he's looking forward to coming over here. But that's what legalism does. It, it works on the outside, not on the heart. So that's what we see here. People looking good, they're, they're acting all pious and righteous and holy, but Jesus says they're full of dead men's bones. It's like a whitewashed tomb. You, know, you can go to some cemeteries, and they make a big deal about keeping those tombs looking very, very clean and shiny. What's in them? Dead people, you know, bones. Things have just kind of deteriorated away. That's what Jesus says. Look how many pastors, leaders in Christianity have fallen because of their sin with lust for power, for money, for women. Whitewashed tombs. This is what Satan does. He hasn't changed his tune at all. He still comes and brings in lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. This is what the Apostle John says, chapter 2, 1 John 2, verses five and through, or 15 to 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, he's not speaking about planet Earth. He's just talking about the worldly system we live in. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God will abide forever. Praise the Lord for forgiveness, because so many, I've known a lot of pastors over the years that have fallen. They're no longer in ministry, and that's all right if they repent and come back and they still are now living for Jesus. That's the important thing. They may have surrendered that, you know, privilege of pastoring because of sin, but Satan wants to keep you down and out. But Jesus says, no, I'm not done with you yet. You're still alive. I still have a work for you to do. And he can still use people no matter what their position may have been. This is how Satan tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, verse 6. Same three things, less of the flesh, less of the eyes, pride of life. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, there's the less of the flesh, that it was pleasant to the eyes, the less of the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, that's the pride of life. Remember, Satan said, you won't die, you'll become just like God. That appealed to her pride. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. In other words, he was allowing the wife to wear the pants in the family at that moment. Dropped his duty as being the head over the household. So he's there with Eve, listening to Satan tempt her. And then he just falls right in line and eats as well. But that's when sin entered the world. They disobeyed God's word. They fell for the lie of Satan. And so it should not surprise us that when Satan comes... And tempts Jesus. He uses the exact same three temptations. Remember, we looked at it in Matthew 4. It's also in Luke 4. Satan came, gave him the temptation, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And every time, how did Jesus respond? It is written. He goes to the Word of God. You have to stay focused, built on the Word of God. These religious hypocrites were all about fulfilling the lusts of their flesh eyes, the pride of life. They're only concerned about their outward appearance, but inside they were full of death. This is why, and we even sang a song earlier, this is why we emphasize giving our hearts to Jesus, giving Him everything. He wants a relationship with you. He doesn't want religious rituals. If Jesus has your heart, then he will begin molding you and shaping you from the inside out. Again, religion wants your outward stuff, your outward body, and then it tries to conform you into what they want you to be. Jesus wants our hearts. He doesn't care about all the other stuff. He'll take care of all the other stuff when he has our heart. Only Jesus, not religion, can bring our dead bones to life. Only Jesus can make those real lasting changes that we desperately long for and need 
2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Religion can't do that for you, but Jesus can. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Well, look at verse 29. He says, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the mount monuments of the righteous and say, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Yeah, they would have. They would have done the same thing. They would have killed the prophets, and they will kill God's people later on. Jesus is telling them that by saying that you are admitting, by saying what they're saying, he says they're admitting to being partakers of the murder of the prophets. Interesting verse in John 8, verses 44 and 45, Jesus is speaking to the same religious leaders, maybe a different group of them, but the same scribes and Pharisees. And he says to them in even stronger terms, you, you guys, you are the, you're of your father the devil. And the desires of your father, we, you know, you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. So in verse 31, he says, Therefore you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. In other words, he's saying, I know what you're going to do to me, so fill up your father's guilt. Let's go. Put me on the cross. You're going to kill me just like you did the, pro uh, the prophets. And that's exactly what they would do. These same guys, a couple days later, are going to be standing before Pontius Pilate. Jesus is there next to Pilate. And Pilate's like, what do you want me to do with this man? Crucify him, crucify him. And it was these religious leaders getting all the people fired up to crucify Jesus. And so he says, okay, this is what you're going to do. You're going to fill up your father's guilt, the measure of your father's guilt. Verse 33 he says, serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? I mean, he's calling them out for what they were, venomous, deceitful creatures who wanted nothing to do with God. They wanted nothing to do with ministering to God's people. They were greedy. They were treacherous. They were on a fast track to the lake of fire. And like a viper, their words were just poisonous. That's what he's telling them. So verse 34, Therefore indeed I send you prophets, wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel. Remember Abel? Cain killing his brother Abel, to the blood of Zechariah the prophet, son of Berechiah. Some have said, yeah, Jesus is saying, you guys, from A to Z, you're going to kill God's people with your attitude. Whom you murder between the temple and the altar. Surely I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. And so he's just laying it out there for him. You guys aren't done killing. You're going to kill me. I'm going to send you those that you're going to also have killed. And that would happen. They would persecute the people of the Lord. They're the ones, after Paul got saved, that the Jews would stir up the crowds to try to kill Paul and get him stoned to death and all these other things. Verse 37, but here's the heart of Jesus. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. That's the heart of Jesus. He didn't want to destroy these religious leaders. He didn't hate them. It's like God looks at all people. He doesn't hate them. He loved the world, so he sent Jesus to die for their sins. He doesn't love the he doesn't hate the sinner, but he hates the sin. That's what it always boils down to. Don't hate sinners. They're just doing what sinners do. They sin. 
So we don't hate him. We love the sinner, but we hate the sin. It's that sin that separates them from God. So we should love him so much and tell him the good news. Jesus wants to set you free. Here's his heart towards these guys. How I just wanted to bring you under my arms, gather you together like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. You know, there's been a lot of, uh, over the years, there, there's been these reports and there's some famous, you know, guys that talked about this as well, where they lived in the old days. They'd have like a barn. They'd have little, you know, chicks in there, chicken coop and stuff. A fire would ro roar through. And I can't remember who this religious guy was, a really famous guy. And, and you know, he was a young boy at the time. And he's going through and everything's destroyed in his barn. The house is destroyed. And he's just going around kicking stuff to see if there's anything survivable. And he sees a dead chicken there and he just kicks it over because it was burned up. And all these little chicks ran out. And that was the heart of that chicken, that hen, to protect her chicks, to just gather them together and put that covering over them because of the fire that was raging down upon them. That's what Jesus is saying. I just want to gather you together. I've got that protective nature. I want to save you. I want to protect you. The world's going down the tubes. I'm the solution. I'm the answer. Come to me, Jesus says. He's telling them, your house is left to you desolate. And, and we'll talk more about this next week, Lord willing, when we come into chapter 24. And then he says in verse 39, For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Two days earlier, that's what they were singing on Palm Sunday. Remember, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He's riding the little donkey. They're all praising, you know, the Lord for coming. This is our Messiah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. And they're just shouting, rejoicing. And Jesus now uses that same verse to say, next time you see me, you'll be saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a reference to his second coming. When he comes back, Revelation 1.7 says that every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. You know, Zechariah 12.10 talks about when Jesus returns, you know, they're going to mourn for him as the only son. They're going to say, where did you get those nail prints in your hands? Jesus said, I got them in the house of my friends. When the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, then all Israel will be saved. When Jesus returns, every Jew who survives the great tribulation, he will protect for the final three and a half years, and we'll talk about this next time as well. But when he comes back, every Jew that sees him is going to recognize this is our Messiah. They will repent. They will get saved. It's going to be glorious. God is not done with the Jewish people. Do not fall for the lie of replacement theology. Great things are in store when Messiah returns. But right now, the church, it's made up of Jews and Gentiles. Anyone who will come to Christ by faith who says, Lord, I'm a sinner, and I know I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. There's no good thing I could ever do to earn merit salvation, but you did everything for me. And you just humble yourself before Christ. Jesus paid the price in full. He shed his blood for your sins, and all you have to do is say, Lord, I need you. Please save me. I mean... That's what he wants. He just wants your heart to recognize he alone is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You surrender your heart to him, and he gives you everlasting life. Remember the Philippian jailer. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Well, let's see. You better start in Genesis, and you, when you get to the Ten Commandments, you better memorize. No. Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved.